My name is Julie Pearson, Little Thunder. Today is Friday, December 1st, 2017, and I'm interviewing Cherokee artist Janet Smith at the Art Market in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Janet, you're a Cherokee Medal of Honor winner, a painter. Um, you have an MS in psychology and art therapy and helped with the art therapy program at the Jack Brown Center. You sign many of your paintings, mostly focused on women and children, with your Cherokee name, Nance. I look forward to hearing more about you and your work. Thank you, Julie. Where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, and uh, I was born at the IHS hospital there. And But my mother and father lived in Wagner. My father was in the service, World War II at that time. And oh. so my mother and I were living in Wagner with my grandmother, my grandparents. And uh, of course, when he came home, we continued to live in Wagoner, and they have a farm there. My grandfather had a cotton gin, and my father worked on the farm as well as the cotton gin. So, so you were exposed to farm life. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> All my life. <laughs> is the Cherokee both on your mom and dad's side? Yes, it is. My mother was full blood, and my father was just a small amount. I believe he was a 16th. So I am six, I am 33 64 is what I am. Um, can you tell me a little more about your grandparents? Um, my grandparents on my mother's side, the maternal side, both passed away when she was a small child. So she grew up at Sequoia. And at that time it was called Sequoia Training School. Mm -hmm. And then um, my grandparents on the, my father's side, um, my grandmother is a descendant from Richard Field, Chief Richard Field. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were from Cleveland, Tennessee originally before all the removal and everything. Um, my great-grandfather was in the Civil War and he came to Indian Territory. He was stationed at Gibson Station during the Civil War and he liked that area of the country and when he went back to Tennessee, there was nothing left of their farm. And so he and a number of his brothers and sisters moved near Wagner, Oklahoma. Mm. And so we've had the farm for all these many years, ever since the Civil War. Well, and I think um, just the ancestor, Richard Field, it's kind of a, an occasion to talk about that Cherokee, the history but with Texas and Mexico a little bit. Right. Can you say something briefly? Right. About? Yes, um, he um, was chief of the Cherokee that moved to the Texas area. And um, um, it was his granddaughter that married into my family. Uh, her name was um, Martha, and uh, his his granddaughter Martha married Alexander Klingon, and that's the lineage. Okay. Um, I believe that um, we're also kin to some of the Smiths, and um, even the chief, mm -hmm. distantly, distantly. Mm -hmm. And I believe that Richard Fields is buried in Texas, but we've never been able to find a grave site for mm -hmm. him, even though we've looked for him. But I, I think that he's a, everything that I've ever read about him has been a real fine. Right. Uh, he was a fine man. Right. Um, any brothers or sisters? Yes, I have two brothers. I had three brothers and one was killed in 1979 in an automobile accident. The other two brothers, one lives in Coweta and just retired from the gas company here in Tulsa. And then the other brother, John, has continued to live on the farm and uh, keep that operational. <laughs> <laughs> oh, neat. That's really neat. Um, what was the creative environment like in your home? I think it was always very creative. My mother, I can remember as a child, I used to sit out on the front porch and I'd just color and color, and I'm sure I colored on the walls and on the cement porch and just everywhere. But I can remember my mother and I cutting out paper dolls and cutting out things. You know, we didn't have very much money. And so we'd cut out things out of the catalogs, you know, girls or boys or whatever. And that was, you know, part of our entertainment. And um, then, too, I had... Um, Aunts, I had one aunt, well, I had two aunts that taught high school in Wagoner, and uh, one of them was very creative. And there was a lady that came to Wagoner, her name was Ruth White, 
during my elementary years. Mm -hmm. And so my grandmother made sure that I took art classes with Mrs. White. And um, during that period of time, I was a little campfire girl and um, um, Mrs. Nelms, who was our campfire leader, took all 10 of her little <laughs> campfire girls to see um, Blue Eagle. I see Blue Eagle. He used to have a little television show in Muskogee mm -hmm. over on Broadway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we went to see him. And of course, he just, you know, was so friendly and just so nice to us. And I was the only identifiable a uh, little Indian person, and I'd taken a little drawing, and he just raved about that, and just just made me feel so good, and I thought I was an artist already. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, that would be a wonderful um, kind of water bench moment. It was. It really was. How old were you? I was probably about 10 at that time. And um, I don't think I see live too many years after that, but I always heard such nice stories about him. And when later on, when I came back to Bacon as a student, and then I was the interim director of the art department for a short period of time, and I used to walk around the campus, and you know, it's an old old campus, and I'd think. I see probably walked in these same <laughs> sidewalks and, and in this building. And, oh, it was a wonderful experience for me. But thank you for sharing that. What is your first memory of seeing Native art? Probably um, with I See Blue Eagle. Mm -hmm. Probably when I went to visit with him, he was such an influence that day that I wanted to see more you know, American Indian art or Native American art. And um, other than that, I don't think that we had very much in our home. You know, the art that I was exposed to was traditional, just traditional art, you know, uh, still lives and, and such as that or landscapes. And you mentioned some of your first memories, but I'm wondering if you have one real clear memory of making the first time you made art? Probably when I was about four, maybe five, I just remember sitting on the front porch with Crayolas and I was just drawing. Of course, I really wasn't drawing. I was probably just scribbling, but I was able to think, you know, I was drawing and I was just having the most wonderful time out on the front porch. And that was, that was just an experience for me. On the wood you were joining? Probably on the wood. I may have had some paper. I really don't remember, but I just remember sitting out there and it was just a great experience just, you know, to interact with all the different, well, I probably had a box of eight crayons. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that the big boxes had come along when I was that age. <laughs> That's neat. Um, you know, you mentioned Ruth White as being the, the art teacher that you were hooked up with through the, and she was in Wagner in the school schools. Did you have any other um, kind of highlight art experiences in either elementary or junior high? There was also a lady um, that came into the school system probably when I was in about the sixth grade and her name was Mona V. Kiso and she was an American Indian lady. I, think that I um, remember that because she just had such a variety of different things for us to work with. With Miss White, we started out with pastels and then we moved on to oils. And um, But with Mona V, she had all kinds of papers for us to work with, construction papers. She had different art materials and she would always name the topic or the colors that we were to work with. And I think it really stirred my imagination of what you could do with primary colors or, or you know, on construction paper, how you could move those shapes and designs around to look like something. So that was fun. Was one of the topics that she offered native subject matter? I don't recall um, Wagner's not, um, the percentage of American Indians, I think, is maybe not as great. Mm -hmm. And I think that we were just exposed to just traditional kind of art mm -hmm. things. So what happened for high school? Where did you go to high school? I went to high school in Wagoner, 
However, I transferred to a small school. I had an aunt that uh, passed away in 1959, and after she passed away, then I transferred to go to school in OK. Just a small school. There were 12 in my graduating class. and um, But it was always kind of fun. And, and, uh, um, I don't think we were had art classes. Mm -hmm. We had a few music, you know, exposures to music. But I continued to draw a little bit, not not too much, but a little bit. Were you entering any art competitions? Not at that time. Okay. Not at that time. So, how did you end up at uh, Bacon? Well, um, after I graduated from high school, I went to Northeastern for two years. And okay. of course, um, my whole curriculum for me was art. I had to take other classes too, but I took art classes as much as possible, and I studied with George Calvert at that time. He was the primary art person there, or instructor, and I just loved him, and I just couldn't, um, I couldn't have enough art. Now, I wanted to take all art classes, just forget the, the other things. It was just fun. I had, the only thing that I didn't care for at that time was the sculptor class. And of course, that was part of your degree program. You had to do clay and, and all of that. And I thought, oh, I don't like this. And I think that's because my mother had been offered um, at Sequoia when she was a, a young person. She had been offered clay and she says, oh, I don't like to get my hands dirty. <laughs> So I must have heard that. And I thought, I don't like that to get story. my hands dirty either. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I couldn't manipulate the clay like I wanted to. So I just like to draw and I just like to paint. And, uh -huh. you know, so you stuck with the two dimensional right. media at right. Northeastern during that time. Right, right. Now, I understand you met Cecil Dick at some point. I'm wondering when that happened. I did. Um, I was at Bacon as a student. I, I got acquainted with Indian art, and I thought, this is what I want to do. And I think part of that experience was here at the art market. I came to shows, oh. and I'd see all the art, and I'd see you know the artists and different people. And so that's how I became familiar. And so then I uh, got a, a, a catalog, and it said Indian art. Well, I wanted to study Indian art. And this was in the 80s, long after I was married and had worked at the telephone company in different places and had my children. So I was, oh, probably in my 30s. Okay. So I was not a traditional student. But I went back to Bay Home with kind of a purpose. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I met Dick West, and I met Ruthie Blaylock Jones, and I studied with both of them, and they became mentors. And I met Cecil Dick while I was at Bacon, and I just love Cecil. I just thought he was the grandest person. And of course, he became one of my mentors also. He had gone to school at Sequoia at the same time my mother did, and they were friends. And he remembered my mother. And of course, my mother just thought he was a grand person. And he's an artist, <laughs> a real live artist, you know. <laughs> and so, uh, I knew that my mother, you know, just thought that was a grand idea for me to visit with Cecil and to talk to him. And so I got acquainted with him, and he just, he and I were just good friends. We were really good friends. I just loved Cecil, and I'd go by and visit with him sometimes in Tahlequah, and he got to know me, and he got to know my husband, and got to know the children. And I think I have the last little painting that he did mm. before he passed away. It's just a little small five by seven, mm. and but I just cherish that. Mm -hmm. What kinds of things do you think you got specifically from from interacting with him. Tradition and culture. He says, you got to paint what you know. And he says, you've got to paint your own tribe. Don't be painting somebody out in the Southwest. Don't do all of that. Mm -hmm. You know, read your stories. And of course, Dick West had always said that. Mm -hmm. Also, he says, you need to read your stories. You need to know, you know who you are as an Indian person. And um, I think that's part of the problem with 
children nowadays, they don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. And some of the gangs and things, I think people, Indian people, young people especially, get involved in gangs because they don't know who they are as Indian people. Mm -hmm. um, when you were studying at Bay Cone, was your were your first explorations with that flat style work? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we were taught to paint in that flat two-dimensional style, and it's called the Baconian style. And even today, I still paint a great many of my paintings in that flat two-dimensional style. I think maybe I have just, maybe my experience was so grand at Bacon and I enjoyed it so much that I've just continued that. Well, it's not an easy style. No, it's very flat. I wonder if you flat. could talk about um, and and sometimes my paintings vary, but for the most part, it's just flat. You know, you paint all the figure. There, you don't show that roundness. You don't mm -hmm. show, you know, that uh, three-dimensional look at all. Mm -hmm. It's very flat. You have some landscape elements, however, maybe a little bit more than you I sometimes do. see in the I flat do. Stuff. I think that I have varied from that, mm -hmm. but for the most part, I. Things are pretty flat. Four figures, <laughs> that's still your approach. <laughs> um, you also uh, studied under Ruthie Blaylock Jones. What what did she bring to the table in terms of things or skill sets that you feel you? I did? think that Ruthie was such an encouraging person, and she was always saying, "Now, Janet, we need to get you into the art market, and we need to get you into different shows." And at that time, when I was at Bacon, there was a student show at the Herd Museum, and she sent my work to the Herd. And I think once upon a time, I won a ribbon there. Oh, that's and, wonderful. Oh, it was. I was very excited. And then later on, we continued with that, and um, her mother became um, sick. And so I had just finished my program at Northeastern, and she said, would you think about coming over here and being the interim person for me for for a year while I take care of my mother. Mm -hmm. Well, it turned into two years, and it was just the best experience you can imagine. I, you know, I was in the art department every day. I had students. I was still learning just as much as my students were, and I met people or other artists. I really became acquainted. Sharon Harjo in Oklahoma City kind of took me under her wing. And at that time, there were shows in Oklahoma City, and she'd say, now, Janet, you need to put something in this show. And so I'd rush around and get something over there. And we had the student shows at Bacon for the students. And it was just a real learning experience. I just had a wonderful time. So it really, although there are some difficulties in balancing your time, it really reinforced your commitment to oh, yes, being an artist. It did. It did. However, while I was at Bacon and while I was a student there, one Sunday on the back side of the classified section of the Tulsa World, there was a big full page article about art therapy and the work that they were doing in Dade County, Florida. And I carried that paper around with me. And I think I'm like many people, sometimes you can't decide what you want to be when you grow up. Mm -hmm. And I'd had two years at Northeastern, and then I come to Bacon, and all I did was take art classes. Well, while I was there during that time, this article was on the in the Tulsa World, and I carried that article around with me, and I read it every day, and I said, this is what I want to do. So, uh, now this was before my tenure at Bacon mm -hmm. in the art department. I was okay. just a student. Okay. And I uh, went back to Northeastern, and I had a purpose. I knew exactly what I wanted to do and what grade point I had to have to get into graduate school. So, you know, I had all these goals, and I met all these goals. I graduated with a fine arts degree. And uh, that was an exciting time. And uh, one of my instructors, her name was Dr. Kathleen Schmidt. I told her from the very beginning, she was my, my advisor, and I said, I'm going to be an art therapist. And I said, I need to find a school. 
that I can get into. And she helped me do that. And we looked at schools. We looked at the University of New Mexico. They had a program. Houston had a program. Emporia, Kansas had a program. Emporia was four hours from my front door to their campus. So I said, that's where I need to go. So she invited um, the director of the art therapy program to come to Northeastern and do a little workshop. And I got to meet him before I ever went. So I've had mentors she and really. helpers <laughs> all the way through. <laughs> she really arranged that nicely. She did. She so did. at this point, are you in your mid-30s? I wish I were. I wish I were. You need to double that, Julie. <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, when, oh, when oh, you're... At, at Northeastern. At Northeastern. Yes. When you're deciding to go yes. back. I was in my mid-30s at that point in time. And you have the family, and you've right. gone back and finished right. the first degree, and then right. on to Emporia. And um, after I finished my degree is when I went to Bay Cone, uh for Ruthie. Mm -hmm. And I was there for two years, and then... I left in 1987. I had already made all my arrangements to go to North, uh, to Emporia State University. Okay. So I was ready to go and do my graduate degree. Now, what did you get from that particular degree that sort of um, impacted your artwork, working on this art therapy degree? I think that um, the art therapy was a whole different world. And I um, thought, if art can help children, if it can help adults, that's what I want to do. And there's such a need for that, especially among Indian people. I think that um, there's so many things. Mm -hmm. And so that was my whole purpose in going back to complete the art therapy degree, is to go to work for my tribe okay. and see what I could do to help them. And I was able to do that. And it hadn't been, that degree hadn't been around all that no, long, had it? No, In the late 60s, several people began to think about art, using art as a therapy. Mm -hmm. So I believe the American Art Therapy Association was founded by about five people in the mid-60s. And this would have been in the 70s mm -hmm. or the 80s. Mm -hmm. So it had not been around very long. And... Um, I think they started out with about five people in the 60s, and by the 80s, there were probably about 5,000. Wow. So it had grown considerable during that length of time. You must have been one of the early Native American I art was. therapists. I was. Uh, when I became accredited, that means that you're art therapy registered, that you're registered with the American Art Therapy Association. I believe either I was the 13th Mm -hmm. There were. I was told that there were 13 American Indian art therapists at that time. Mm -hmm. And so I felt very pleased. I felt um, that I really needed to share my information, and I did that. And it was really kind of funny. I went back to work for Bacon College in a different capacity other than the art. I was doing counseling and different things, and um, I thought, but I really wasn't using the therapy as much. And I really thought, gosh, I've been, you know, to Emporia. I've got all this degree and everything. Why am I not doing art therapy? You know, why is it somebody knocking on my door? <laughs> <laughs> and somebody did. One day I was in my office and somebody called. And they said, we're with Cherokee Nation, and we'd like to visit with you. We understand you're an art therapist. And I said, oh, yes, <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> and um, it was, um, I'll have to think a minute. I can't think of her name. But anyhow, she was the director of the health department. And uh, she asked me if I'd like to think about doing some work with Jack Brown. And uh, I didn't want to just jump up and down and <laughs> act like a silly person. <laughs> but I said, yes, I, I think I'd like to do that. And so I did. And um, at first, I was just working two days a week and still working at Bay Cone. And little by little, she could see that it was something that was you know, beneficial to the mm -hmm. clients. Mm -hmm. And so she hired me full time. 
And so I did that for several years, and then they asked me if I'd like to work in Claremore in behavioral health, and I did family therapy with them. With well, using them. your art mm-hmm. therapy degree. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And, uh, what kinds of, um, you know, when you come into an institution and they have this program, but of course you you are building the program at the same time or, you know, adapting or improving it as you as you can. So what kinds of things did you, do you feel you accomplished there at Jack Brown? One of the things I said, I, I built my program on building a cultural, I thought, I I'd say even today that any people don't always know what their culture is. And I said, they need to know who they are as an in people. And I had um, the experience of working with so many tribes at Bacon that I really worked well with students or clients that came into Jack Brown because we took them from all over the United States and from many, many different tribes. And so I knew a little bit Mm -hmm. about a lot of different tribes. And so we could talk about those things. I had another young man, James Williams, David Williams' son, Mm-hmm. And um, he would take the clients to the library for me. They would look up information about their tribes. So we began to work, you know, with cultural knowledge, mm-hmm. and we did that as well as the therapeutic kind of things that we did, assessments and and such as that, and looking at issues. But we'd try to do that with clients, and we had. Uh, medicine people that came in and did Mm -hmm. sweat lodges and Mm -hmm. so we built that program so that we were doing all of the things to help them spiritually and Mm -hmm. emotionally Mm -hmm. and we uh, talked about the medicine wheel a lot Mm -hmm. and so it was really it was just a fun kind of time because I got to build my own program and I got to do the things that I wanted to do. And they, they gave me the freedom to do that. Mm-hmm. So it was a wonderful experience, just good. I've always had good experiences. Without really naming any names, I wonder what, what do you think was one of your, a, a nice success story, person who came out of that program? I had um, a young lady and um, she was a very young person she adapted to the art therapy, you know, the techniques very easily, and she could see right away. She was a very bright young woman, and she could see things and those drawings, and mm. she'd say, look at this, look at that. And she'd say, I didn't realize that. She picked up those things just herself without my ever say anything, because as an art therapist, whatever you say about that drawing is the way it is. Mm. I might have my own thoughts or maybe a little different interpretation or something, but whatever you say is the way it is. Mm -hmm. And she could see things in her drawings and she could make conclusions. And later on, she went on to Northeastern and graduated out of the social work department and then went to work for Cherokee Nation and the social work program. So she was certainly a success story. That's wonderful. Now, you you go to work at, um, at Claremore Indian Hospital in behavioral health, and then are you entering any art shows yet, or not yet? Probably I'm not doing very much art of my own at this time. Mm-hmm. I am um, I've always drawn, and I I will continue to forever, as long as I can hold that pencil. And one of the things that I learned in Emporia is everybody's creative, everybody can draw, even though when you're about nine or 10, sometimes you'll say, oh, I can't draw, because you recognize that maybe another student does have ability and does have talent and you say, oh, I can't do that, and you'll stop. Mm -hmm. But everybody has ability. Even if you scribble, just scribble. It gets those emotions out of your body when things are going on. And so I always did scribble drawings. I still do them. And then after I look at that scribble drawing, sometimes things will appear. Mm -hmm. You know, just, just, oh, that looks, it's like looking at the clouds. Mm -hmm. You'll see things in the clouds. Well, it's the same way with scribble drawings, so that's kind of fun to do, and it gets those emotions out, and that creativeness within you 
Because you're sewing, time sewing. Yeah. So when did you actually start getting active in the native art markets? Um, and you mentioned coming to these shows at the art market being, I think, one inspiration. Yes, I did that all during the time. And I was still doing some of that as a student at Emporia. I was still doing some art shows and mm -hmm. things and, okay. and painting. Um, however, I became so involved in the art therapy and at Jack Brown, I really wasn't able to paint as much. Mm -hmm. um, when I had been there probably about... Um, Oh, in the mid-90s, uh, I was asked to come back to Emporia as an interim instructor. And so uh, they had hired a lady to come in and, and do the art therapy. There, um, Mr. Alt was there. Robert Alt was one of the founding members of the Art Therapy Association, and he was my mentor. They had hired another person in the art Pro, in the art therapy program and then they hired another one it had grown that much mm -hmm. and sh something happened with her father and she was unable to come in so at the very last minute they needed somebody to come so they called and asked me if I would think about coming to Emporia just for a year and I said if it's just for a year I'll come so I left Jack Brown I left the behavioral health unit and went to Emporia and taught school there at the university for a year and then I came back. Pam Irons is the name I was trying okay. to think of a few oh, minutes yes. ago. Pam, um, they had a, a position open for the director of Jack Brown. And so um, I'm sure it was Pam. Pam had somebody call me and ask me if I might be interested <laughs> in coming back to Oklahoma. And so I said, well, yes, I guess I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Uh, I did, and I put my uh, name in the pot for the director position, and I was accepted. And she asked me if I could just kind of come in and make that transition, um, you know, little by little. And so I did. I was still at Emporia in the spring, and then I'd come in on, on days off from Emporia. On Friday, I didn't teach, didn't have any classes, mm -hmm. so on Fridays, I'd come back to Jack Brown. And wow. we did that for several weeks. And then in June, I became the schedule. director. <laughs> and that kind of ended my <laughs> art career. Gosh, <laughs> when you're a director of a program, you just, uh, that's that's your whole focus. Right. So you then had moved into administrative work right. and you weren't doing the art therapy right. directly with the. Right. right. But I hired somebody else. Mm -hmm. uh, I was the first art therapist at Cherokee Nation. And then I brought in an art therapist. Mm -hmm. And we had several interns from Southwestern College and in uh, Santa Fe. We had interns from Emporia State. So we always had interns and um, at the time I was there, we had, I was still considered an art therapist and I still did art therapy with some of the clients. Mm -hmm. And we had a full-time art therapist there. We had a full-time art therapist in the behavioral health. And then um, I believe we had two. And then we had one other girl that went to Emporia and then I believe she went to OSU and got her doctoral degree. And I believe she's in Lawton now. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that sounds like a great program. Art's important. It is. Art it is. is so important. And um, I just think it's one of the common denominators among all mm -hmm. people. You know, mm -hmm. all people. Right. You, know, you can understand drawings and you can recognize, you know, what people are trying to say in mm -hmm. that drawing. Mm -hmm. so, um, there was a show at Gilcrease, I believe it was last year, by an artist that passed away. I can't recall his name right now, but it was a wonderful mm -hmm. show. And as an art therapist, I just marveled. I just marveled at all the things that he was saying in his artwork. Wow. It was just, it was very emotional. And in Santa Fe, um, there's an artist, and I'll think of her name in just a minute. And they did a retrospect. She died of cancer. And mm, um, it wasn't Margaret Bagshaw. It was her mother, Helen Harden. Helen Harden. They did a, a retrospect show, and I could see things in her work. And I used to do a workshop mm. over that exhibit. I knew almost going through that 
when she really got sick, you could mm -hmm. tell by the colors, the different things, mm -hmm. techniques. Mm -hmm. And towards the end, her work just changed completely, mm -hmm. just in those last few months. And uh, after I went through and looked at that, and you might not want to say Helen Horton in there. Some people might not want to know those things. We can, that can okay, be you can be out edited out. Want. Okay, but um, the artist, um, it, it was, after I looked at the retrospect show, I had to go sit down. It was so mm. emotionally moving mm -hmm. to be able to see her work from the time she was a child mm -hmm. all the way through at her height and then to see that decline mm -hmm. due to the illness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When, was, when did you go to that retrospective? I want to say mid-90s. I can't remember exactly when she passed, but right. she had been gone for a while. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it was at Santa Fe in the IA, IA Museum there. Right. Um, were you exploring any other media during this time at all? Clay, especially clay you with got the back clients. To the sculpture a little right. bit. Right. I said, it's so but, good for the clients. I can just pound on that clay as well as myself to relieve, you know, tension and different things. And um, I said, we need somebody to work with clay. Mm -hmm. And about that time, Mike Daniels and Telequa retired from his teaching position. So I said, Mike, would you think about coming out to Jack Brown just on a contract, maybe once a week? And he did, and he worked with those clients, and, and he taught them lots of things. So it was a really good experience for them. And of course, I always, you know, picked up some of that clay and I just pound on it and just turn it this way and that way. And <laughs> <laughs> it wondered, I'm sure, <laughs> what I was going to do to it. <laughs> What is your favorite subject to paint? Nowadays, I paint nearly, well, I do turtles. Uh, and that brings us to another area. About 10 years ago, I had breast cancer. And um, I said, um, we need to be like the turtles and just slow down right. and just get in that shell and take care of ourselves. And so I began to, that became my mantra at that point in time for several years. That's all I did is just turtles and I just decorate them in all different fashions. And um, then I decided, well, I don't just have to do turtles. I guess that was part of my healing. Right. And um, so I began to do other things and nearly everything I do is Cherokee and mm -hmm. it's all cultural, has been nearly since I went to school at Bay Cone. Mm -hmm. But every once in a while I do something different. You know. But for the most part, 90% of my work is Cherokee and it's all cultural. The presence of women is a very yes. strong yes, theme it in is. your work, women and children. Yes, it is. Uh, women have always, I've had strong women in my family. My grandmother was very strong and I lived with her a good portion of the time when I was young. I had two aunts that taught school in Wagoner. They were strong presence and I was the only niece. I had two other cousins, but one lived in California and one in Kansas City and they were so much older. Mm -hmm. So attention was focused on me. And, and my brothers, too. But women, my mother, um, my mother was, um, she was kind of a particular little lady, and she wasn't overly excited to have me in her kitchen moving things around and doing things. But my grandmother was always, you know, we can do this and we can do that. And I was always rolling that dough and helping her make biscuits and doing this. And, and they'd say, well, look in the cookbook and see what you want to make. And I'd find cookie recipes. They didn't mind. You know, I probably got everything in the whole house dirty. But, you know, it was all right. That was a learning experience. And they just let me play, kind of like, you know, that's another art experience almost. <laughs> it is, it is. Did you have any gathering experiences with them? Always, mm -hmm. always. Um, my grandmother had um, four daughters and she had three sons. And they always, um, you know, they always 
talked about, you know, they were always together. They came home as often as they could. Mm. And um, it was just a wonderful experience. And with my mother's family, we went to decoration always once a year. We went to decoration, and her family's all buried over at Green Cemetery mm -hmm. close to Westville. Mm -hmm. And we always had big dinners on the grounds. And, and one of her brothers had a great big iron kettle, and he made the coffee, just poured that coffee in there and stirred it and stirred it. And, and oh, you know, dinners on the grounds. And, and of course, we always went to church. We Oh, and we had to behave. We didn't go in that church and cut up. My mother made sure that we behaved in that church. I know her. No telling what would have happened. How about wild foods? Did did you go <clears> out a little bit with My your, mother okay. always had kanachi, and lots of times when we went to decoration, that was always served. Mm -hmm. And uh, greens. We always went out in the springtime and picked greens and different things. And and um, blackberries. We always had to put blackberries and carried that little old tin bucket, syrup bucket around, picking those blackberries and putting them in there. And, <laughs> And um, we had fish, you know. Mm -hmm. We weren't great fishermen, but we always had fish. Mm -hmm. And pecans. We mm -hmm. always had pecan trees on our farm. The little tiny things, no bigger than your <laughs> little finger. <laughs> but we had to go pick pecans. <laughs> so, essentially, was it when you retired that you were able to... Yes. When I retired, I said, yeah, now I shows. can do as I choose to do. And... Um, uh, even though I love the art therapy, and I still do some of that in my home, and I still work with a few children, and uh, just recently I talked to Jack Brown and behavioral health, and I may go back and just do some of that. Mm -hmm. Not not on a regular basis, but just some of that. But I thought, I can paint, and I can do things that I want to do now. And so I feel as if... and. Way back in the 80s when I was in graduate school, I worked for Linda one summer, and now here I am back again. So things just That's go an interesting round circle, and isn't round. It? <laughs> it does, in more than one way. And of course, I'm, I'm still, uh, not long ago, I received an appointment on the board of trustees at Southwestern College in Santa Fe. Well, one of my commitments is to bring in interns art therapy interns, and I'm so disappointed. I felt like as long as I was an art therapist, I really, I, I took this out. I did workshop. Anybody that called me, I did a workshop for mm -hmm. them. Indian Health Service, I was all over the United mm -hmm. States doing, you know, things for people, Indian mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And then when I got sick, I just kind of stopped all that mm -hmm. and really got like the turtle and just got in my shell and just kind of, you know, tried to take care of myself. Right. But now I feel like I'm healthy and I can do things. And so I, I joined the board and I hope to bring in art therapists at Cherokee Nation again. Yes. And uh, I've thought about, I did work for Choctaw Nation at one time. Mm -hmm. I did some work for Osage Nation. So I thought, you know, this should, but I don't want to get too carried away. You know, I don't want, I've got to learn to balance mm -hmm. that out. Mm -hmm. And I'm not 35, I'm not 40 mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I have to kind of balance that out. And that's not easy for me. <laughs> I want to just do everything. <laughs> what? was an honor or award that you've had for your art that kind of stands out for you? I think, um, I can't remember exactly. It was in the 90s. I believe it was long about 90 or maybe 2003 or four. I received the Tricky Medal of Honor mm -hmm. and I, I was just overwhelmed with that. I Can you explain was... sort of the significance of that well, award? There were so few given out. You know, Sequoia had a Cherokee Medal of Honor. He was the first one. And then there were none. Anna Gritz, mm. Kilpatrick, received one. She and her husband, Jack, for all of the work that they did for the Cherokee Nation. And then they began to give them out again, probably in the 80s, 90s. And uh, I felt to be in that group of people it's just over the top for me. 
And of course, Cecil Dick got one. And of course, Cecil Dick's my hero. So. Right. It's, it's a one congratulations on that. But then I, another award that I received that was very significant for me was I was um, selected uh, at Emporia State University as um, not the most valuable alumni, but um, one of the most valuable recent graduates right after I graduated. The next year after I graduated, there was an article in the paper about me. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I sent it back to Emporia so that they would see that I was making a contribution, that I was taking what I had learned and applying it. And so um, I got a letter not too long after that that I had been nominated and then I received the award. And um, for me that was just wonderful. On my mother's side of the family, I was the first in her family to graduate from high school. And then I was the, well, I was the first. My two brothers graduated before I did, because <laughs> I dropped out for a long time. <laughs> but then I went back. Right. And um, of course I was the first on her side of the family to have a master's degree, and so. That's so neat. So education is very, I, it's, it's it's just a necessary thing. Mm -hmm. People need to go to school. Mm -hmm. They really do. And you're also a member of the Spider Art Gallery I am, on the board. I am. And that's always nice. They call me periodically and we look at other artists. And I think that's a way to encourage them mm -hmm. to bring their art in. And uh, we've I, it's just a wonderful opportunity for so many artists because there are artists that have their own studio within that environment. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think about Lisa Rutherford, right? She's basket one. maker. Um, Andrew does lots of clay work. Mm -hmm. Jane Austen comes in. She does clay work. And just this summer, they've asked me to come in and work with just a few clients mm -hmm. through the art therapy and I've done that. I've been able to do that. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm continuing to work. Other people are working and bringing their art and they sell that art. <laughs> <laughs> and that's always good. <laughs> always good. <laughs> and that gallery, Spider Gallery, has now been there for I think about 10, 12 years? At least 10 years. Okay. At least 10 years. Oh, run by Cherokee Nation. Right. Right. It's, yeah, really been a neat, innovative thing. Well, let's talk about your artistic approach and techniques a bit more, and then we're going to look at your work. Um, so in terms of painting, your primary materials are? Sometimes I still paint on mat board just like I did in the bacon days and just like many artists before me with a little bit of tempera and watercolor mixed together and that's the old traditional style. Once in a while I still do that but primarily I use acrylic now mm -hmm. and uh, canvas. And canvas. Right. right, right. But those are my primary mediums. And your format sort of medium size as yeah. opposed to not necessarily miniatures or really big paintings. Right. Once in a while I, I do a large painting, but very seldom. Mm -hmm. you know, I just do maybe 16 by 20 or smaller than that. Mm -hmm. um, how would you describe your palette or palette? In terms of color, my favorite color to work with is blue. And of course, uh, that goes back, I think, to that medicine wheel and the four mm. colors of the Cherokee people. And I would like to think I'm still in my fall. And if I was gonna live to about 120, probably, I would still be in the fall of my life. <laughs> but I believe I have moved into that elder area. <laughs> and of course, that color is blue. And that's, you know, I'm just attracted to blue. In okay. fact, you've got a really neat piece we're going to look at that has a lot of blue in it. All right. In it. Um, 
how has your painting changed over the years? Because you don't work exclusively in that flat style. You do do other things. Right, I do. And some ceramic work too. Right. I think that as an artist, um, I'm not stagnant. I think that I'm very eclectic. And I think as an art therapist, whatever is going on with me is going to come out on that canvas or on that mat board. I see that and sometimes I can go back and look at that and say, hmm, just like my blue, my grandmother of the North. Mm -hmm. I think that's where I am right now. And I think that's what and people say, well, that's you. And then they'll, and people that knew my mother will say, that's your mother. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think that we, what, what's going on here mm -hmm. it just comes right out on that canvas. Mm -hmm. And I see that in artists. One of the things I will tell you is um, when you see rainbows in drawings, that just means that it's a time of transition mm -hmm. when you see that rainbow. Mm -hmm. And if you think about children when they're about five, six years old, they draw lots of rainbows. Well, they're transitioning. They're not that little, little child. They're moving into the school age child. So that's just a natural thing for them to draw. So that's a yeah. neat observation to share. Do you do a lot of preliminary sketching for a painting? No, no, very little. Mm -hmm. I uh, paint directly on that canvas. Mm -hmm. When I, I, I was taught at Bay Cone to always do a sketch and then we put down that tracing paper and we traced and we turned it over to make sure that everything wasn't just plumper jawed. Mm -hmm. But no, I don't do that any longer. I might need to sometimes. <laughs> my, my fingers might be kind of, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> um, what is your um, research? process? Do you have a research process? I've always had a research process since I was at Bacon, and I go back and I look at things and I read and sometimes I look at other artists work to see maybe what they've done with certain mm -hmm. subject matter mm -hmm. and um, then I draw my own conclusion and then I do it my way. <laughs> hey, that's like Frank Sinatra, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> I do it my way. <laughs> How about your creative process, starting with the time that you get an idea? Sometimes things have to float around in my head for a little while before I can actually put them on a piece of paper. And sometimes I can see something and I think, oh, that would be really interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes I go right home and begin to work on something. And sometimes I don't. It just has to float around for a while. And you're not necessarily your creative routine isn't necessarily paint during the day, paint at night. I used to always paint at night. Dick West told me when I was his student, he says, you paint at night or you paint by yourself because if other people come through, they'll make suggestions. They'll say, oh, that needs to be like that. Change this. And it turns into somebody else's work of art. So he says, you paint by yourself and you paint at night. So I used to stay up way late at night and I'd paint. Well, that didn't always work out too well. <laughs> but, uh, but no, I've always painted by myself. I, uh, I have a studio and I go to my studio and that's where I paint. You have your own separate space right. there. Yeah. Right, I do. I no longer have to paint at the kitchen table or pull out a drawing <laughs> to put my canvas on. <laughs> well, um, it, it, looking back on your career so far, what was a kind of fork in the road for you art-wise where you could have gone one way and you went this other way? I think when I read the article in the Tulsa World and I decided to become an art therapist, I think that I put my own art on the back burner at that point in time. And I could have continued, and uh, my, my life might have been very different, mm -hmm. but I chose to go a different way. But now I've and been able to pick it back up. 
Yes, so. and made so many important, such an impact I on hope a so. lot of lives. I hope so. How about one of your career high points so far? Probably the, the grandest thing I ever did was when I went to work for Jack Brown and uh, introduced art therapy into that program. Mm -hmm. I'm very pleased that I was able to do that. I was able to uh, teach an introduction to art therapy at Northeastern, and I did that for 20 years. Out of the social work program, even though I am a psychologist, mm. <laughs> or I have a psychology right, background. Your degree, right, right. Mm -hmm. How about one of the low points in your career so far? I think when I got sick, mm -hmm. that was um, not a wonderful thing. And, uh, but even that was a growth experience. Mm -hmm. I think you have to look at things and even bad experiences or growth experiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about before we look at your artwork? I can't think of anything. I think I've shared and shared and shared with you. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll pause it for a minute and we'll okay. take a look at this work. So you did eventually pick up clay again, and this is one of your... I did, and I had a little bit more control over it than I used to. Um, this piece is called Turtle Chase. And, of course, the turtle has become my mantra in the last few years. Mm. But uh, each one of the turtles has Cherokee designs on it. And I said, even though turtles get in that shell and take care of themselves, sometimes they get pretty busy and they're chasing around. <laughs> it has a really neat feeling of movement to it and some neat textures too. Thank you. And here we have a reproduction of a turtle painting. Yes, this is called Rice for the Cure, and I did this probably about 10 years ago after I had breast cancer, and I said, uh, for me, it was therapeutic in the fact that cancer affects everyone. It doesn't discriminate. There's no racial uh, discrimination whatsoever, whether you're red or you're yellow or you're black or you're white. We all go through those same things and those same feelings. So I said, they've got those little pink ribbons representing the race for the cure. And um, on the bottom, there are flowers, little daisies. Mm -hmm. And I said, this is a growth experience regardless of where we are. Uh, it's a growth experience. But at the same time, you see these little dragonflies yes. chasing the turtles, and sometimes you have these little thoughts. Even though you know you're doing well and you feel better, sometimes those little thoughts will creep in. If you have a little ache or pain, those little thoughts just creep in. I see. And the very gold on the bottom and on the shells, the gold and silver, we're valuable people. All of us are valuable people, and sometimes we don't realize how valuable we are. Oh, that just really has a lot of neat, neat messages. And this was not done for a fundraiser of any no, kind. It was just no. done as your self-expression. No. And how about this piece? Well, as you can see, I'm very eclectic. I don't stay with anything too long. I work on the turtles for a while, and then I'm off to something else. And this is called uh, Midnight Dancers. And a long, long time ago, they're... they're um, Booger masks is what the gentlemen have on. And uh, a long time ago, maybe in the 1700s, 1800s, when the dominant culture began to come into the southeast part of the country, the people, Cherokees, even Creeks, I think, mm -hmm. and maybe other tribes thought, well, if we can carve some really scary, frightening masks, we can scare those people away. And uh, the dominant culture even brought in diseases and different things, mm -hmm. and they would put on those masks, and they would use them for medicinal purposes. They thought, we can scare these things away, but obviously it did not work. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a reproduction of a, uh, an acrylic painting? Watercolor and, and watercolor tempera, I believe. Watercolor and tempera, okay. 
This is part of the Four Seasons, Four Directions. And uh, as Julie said, this is a print, and this is called the spring. And in nearly all, there's little stories on the back side of each one of these little um, prints. In nearly all Indian homes, there's at least three generations. There's granny or auntie, there's the daughter and the grandchildren. And as you can see, they're out picking wild and digging wild onions. You know, in the spring, that's one of our big foods. We always have wild onion dinners. So these little ladies are out there doing that. And there are three more of these little, of this series. The second one, the ladies are out picking blackberries. Mm -hmm. And in the fall, they're out picking pecans. And then in the winter, they're out picking up wood. <laughs> so that's just part of that circle that that four directions. Right, it's really a nice little painting. Okay, now we're looking at your piece. This is called Grandmother of the North. And um, people who know me sometimes think this is a self-portrait. I don't <laughs> think so necessarily. But um, the color for the North is blue. And um, I think when you reach this age or, or at this time in your life when you're the grandmother, it's about giving back. And mm -hmm. if you can see her hands, she's got a basket, and it probably has something that she's giving away. Um, so I think that um, she's, she's the grandmother. And as the grandmother, you're constantly giving to your grandchildren, you're giving to your <laughs> children, you're giving to others. <laughs> But uh, that's just part of the life. That's part of that circle of life when you go around. Then, as a child, people give to you. Mm -hmm. As an adult, people are still sometimes giving to you. But as a, the grandmother, it's your turn to give back. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Oh, Janet. this has been my pleasure. I've enjoyed it very much.